Good. Good, good, good. Right, now, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, over the luncheon adjournment, I have been provided with information that two persons have uh, additional questions. What I'm going to do is um, ask them in turn to come up and um, give me their question from the lectern here so they can address you. So uh, the questions, or the persons that want to ask questions are Mr. Um, Anna Amwar, who uh, is the Solicitor for Scottish COVID Bereave, uh, and Ms. Amber Galbraith, who is the lead counsel, I assume, for uh, Care Home Relatives Scotland. So, Mr. Amwar, first, if you would please. Obliged, Your Lordship. Um, in the first instance, if, if this fails, it's because the Wi-Fi connection is awful, and I hope at the next set of hearings that that is fully checked out before we go into the hearing process. But as Your Lordship said, I'm the lead solicitor for the Scottish COVID bereaved, and I have a handful of questions for Your Lordship and your senior counsel. The public, quite rightly, are looking for answers, and no more so than loved ones of the nearly 16,450 people in Scotland who died from the pandemic. The inquiry has claimed repeatedly, and it has so again today, that it is human rights based. So the question, having spoken to, to, to our clients earlier on and prior to this, is the question that the Scottish COVID bereaved and many other co-participants I've spoken to are asking is that why can they not be given precise dates of hearings? It starts on Tuesday the 24th of October, which happens to be the same date that the preliminary hearing into Module 2A is taking place in London for the UK inquiry, and that impacts on Scotland. And when after that, will this hearing actually sit? We have been provided um, by the UK inquiry dates of hearings of up to six months in advance into 2024, yet the Scottish inquiry is still unable to provide precise details of when from 24th of October onwards the inquiry will actually sit. Uh, we, we understand that you have a memorandum of understanding with the UK inquiry and, and the Scottish COVID bereaved welcome that. We know um, that module two impacts on Scotland. And we have dates of 20th, 30th of October till the 1st of November, 1st of November till the 9th of November, 20th of November to the 30th of November and the 8th, the 1st of December to the 7th of December when module two is sitting in London. So one wonders how exactly is it not clashing? And I appreciate, and we have said to our clients, that there will be an overlap in dates and hearings, but clarity and preciseness is important, not just to the bereaved, but also to their representatives who have to organize their diaries um, and be able to make sure that counsel, solicitors are available to fully represent and adequately represent their clients. Um, both our clients and their representatives have the right to know in advance. The bereaves have said it is deeply traumatizing for them to even be here today. They have this hanging over them and to not even know when they have family commitments, when they have work commitments. Many of the families we represent have deep, are, are suffering from financial crisis, but also from the crisis that they lost their loved ones. And the idea that somehow they should drop everything a few days in advance or a week in advance or two weeks in advance is simply unacceptable and repeats. It traumatizes those who want to speak and who want a right, that have a right to clarity and they want to be front and center. There are also 37 core participants um, so far, we've heard very little about the other core, other core participants today. I'm conscious of the fact that um, there's myself and somebody else asking questions today, uh, but we've only so far heard about the care homes and the Scottish COVID bereave. I know that many of my clients also happen to be frontline workers. They happen to be members of trade unions. There are people involved with the care homes, and many of the core participants want to know when will they be involved? When will they be spoken to? All those in issues interlap. Inter, in, interact with each other and that is essential that this inquiry if it is human rights based and these families and the bereaved and frontline workers and trade unions and the refugees and the minorities and minority ethnic communities are front and center of this inquiry then that should that should most definitely be addressed and not left up in the air because again that re-traumatizes again there is a concern and there is a concern from what has been said today that it would appear that no politicians no ministers and no senior civil servants will give evidence until 2025. We have already heard from a former prime minister 
Um, we've heard from the Chancellor, former Chancellor of the Exchequer, we've heard from the former First Minister um, in, in, in the London Inquiry, and we know other individuals are being getting called back for October, November, and December. Um, and another matter that arises, I understand, is that no core participants, out of the 37 core participants, have received any disclosure of WERF or for evidence. For comparison, we received disclosure from the UK Inquiry almost six months in advance of the hearing so we could be ready. We will disclose a total of 35,370 documents totaling around 385,436 pages. However, when it comes to the Scottish inquiry, we have to date received only one report of which the main part of the report is 127 pages from an expert that our clients do not accept as an expert. We, we understand that you and um, senior counsel will decide who gives evidence, uh, where is the, the clarity on the participation of core participants in that process? How is that human rights based? Will we have any involvement? Or is it simply the case that it will be your lordship and senior counsel that will decide who gives evidence in the impact hearing? I am one of those who I remember at the start of the UK inquiry explained to our clients and accepted the fact that it would be impossible for all bereaved to come to an inquiry to give evidence. But what happened in the UK inquiry was that the statements were taken, they were provided to the inquiry, and out of that, it was selected core individuals who would come forward and give evidence. I am concerned when it is said there is no time limit on giving evidence that we have, we have a, not, I don't like to call it tradition, but in this country where inquiries trundle on for years. Your interim solicitor, of course, was involved in the Trams inquiry, which is still yet to report and has spent 13 million pounds. This inquiry, we sought an FOI in terms of um, clarification of the costs. Eight million pounds have been spent on this inquiry. We have not received any answers of, of breakdown of costs, but there is a real concern that this will break the record of the Iraq Chilcot inquiry, which the Trams inquiry had in terms of that. The families do not want haste at the expense of it being robust and independent and transparent, but they do have a right to know exactly what is happening with regards to cost, expenditure, even in terms of the general day-to-day -day of an inquiry hearings, how people are treated, whether it is trauma-based, whether counsellors are available, etc. The, the final question, uh, my lord, is that why is there such secrecy around experts? How can we prepare if we do not know in advance? Dr. Croft, as far as we're concerned, and that's the only ex so-called expert that we can go by, but as far as the Scottish COVID bereaved were concerned, his evidence was disastrous, and we do not want to repeat that. However, we are entitled, if it is a human rights-based inquiry, and it is operating, it has a gold-plated standard in which to, to look at, to know who the experts are in advance, in order that we may instruct and seek permission and seek leave to instruct our own experts to advise on that. Not to be told four weeks in advance, this is far too important, and we need to have that clarified. Oblige you. Thank you. Um, do you want to go back to your seat, or do you want to sit? Yeah. Good. Thank you. I'll just wait till you're back in your seat. Well, um, as you fairly said at the beginning, there are a number of questions uh, embedded in that speech, uh, and. Uh, I think, in fairness, quite a lot of the points that you have raised have been covered uh, in what I've already said today. Um, however, I will highlight certain matters. I'm also going to call on Mr. Gale to address certain of those issues uh, because he's uh, the person that is directly concerned. The first one uh, concerned timings. Uh, and you indicated that you had, I think you said, uh, notice of specific dates of hearings from the UK inquiry six months in advance, but uh, unless my arithmetic is very wrong, Mr Gale this morning gave you uh, a clear indication of what his intention was in relation to adducing evidence uh, in a period which uh, is, I think, a little in excess of six months. Uh, it is in what Mr Gale said earlier this morning, but I think in fairness, and to be absolutely clear, I'm going to ask Mr. Gale again uh, to explain his plan for the hearings um, between now and Easter, which I think is at the beginning of April next year. Mr. Gale. Thank you, my Lord. <coughs> <coughs> 
Yes, uh, as I said earlier, uh, the plan is to commence impact hearings uh, on the uh, 24th of October, and I indicated that they would be uh, each day, a four-day week, uh, and run through to the 8th of uh, December. <coughs> Initially, we are going to hear from representative witnesses, and a quite deliberate decision has been taken on that, and that thereafter we will hear from care home relatives and the COVID bereaved group, and the intention is that there will be witnesses um, through that period up until the 8th uh, of December. If there are more witnesses than we can accommodate in that period, we will have further hearings in relation to those witnesses. We are not prescriptive in cutting off witnesses as, as at the 8th uh, of December, and I hope I made that clear. Um, thereafter, into uh, the new year, uh, we have a period when we will not be sitting due to the presence here of the UK inquiry, um, and that thereafter we will re resume our hearings in, April, in, <coughs> excuse me, in February and run through to uh, um, Easter. During that time, we will hear from other impacted witnesses and groups, um, and that will include, uh, as I think I made clear at an earlier uh, hearing and also at an earlier meeting that I had with uh, some of the parties, that will include, for example, those who uh, were uh, um, employed within the care and health sectors. We will also hear from witnesses and their impacts um, who were uh, in the refugee community. We will also hear from uh, witnesses <coughs> who were in prison. We have, a, we have dedicated teams looking at each of these areas, and they are just some. We will also be looking specifically at hospitals, and we will be looking at care in the community. So we have the intention of obtaining as much information on impacts in as many settings as we can conceivably accommodate. So um, that is our plan. <coughs> as I say, we have um, a number of dedicated teams. And uh, when I say dedicated teams, I use that word in two senses. They are very dedicated to what they're doing and they are specific in relation to what they are doing. They are looking, for example, there is a dedicated team looking to those who were uh, impacted by the use of do not resuscitate notices. There is a, we already have a number <coughs> of witnesses who are in within that category. We have statements from them. We have material from them. We have liaised with hospice groups. We have liaised with groups providing palliative and end-of-life care. So um, I would like to reassure uh, Mr. Anwar that all these matters are in hand, are well uh, in hand and prepared. We are utilizing the statements that his firm gave us last week in relation to uh, his, cli his client, the witnesses within his client group. <coughs> And we will be in touch with him and his clients, and through, through him, his clients, to advise as to when his clients will be giving evidence. Thank you, Mr. Gill. Now, there's another, a number of other points ancillary to that that arose in the questions, Mr. Amware. Um, the first one is in relation to hearings on the same dates as the UK inquiry has intimated it's having hearings. Um, as I said earlier this morning, there is a memorandum of understanding between the two inquiries, uh, and that memorandum of understanding encompasses trying, where possible, uh, to avoid having hearings on the same dates, or certainly hearings concerning the same subjects on the same dates. Um, in relation to that, it is not an absolute undertaking not to have hearings on the same dates, although we will do our 
use our best endeavours to avoid having hearings on the same dates. My understanding is that the hearings of the UK inquiry in the months of October, November and December uh, do not directly relate to Scottish matters. And that was a factor we took into account. Now, I immediately acknowledge uh, that there may be dates um, when uh, representatives who are participants in both inquiries might feel a need to be at the UK inquiry, even if it's not dealing specifically with Scottish matters. If there are such dates, um, then uh, we would be willing on representations being made to us by the participant involved to consider whether we can do anything about that. Uh, but uh, as a matter of generality, uh, my understanding is the UK inquiry is not dealing with Scottish matters. Obviously, um, we are accommodating the UK inquiry uh, by not sitting uh, when it is dealing with Scottish matters um, in January of next year. That's the first point. The second point is in relation uh, to uh, the question or the issue uh, uh, why uh, our, our, our focus uh, in this case. One of the reasons we're having hearings when we're having hearings in October is because we are taking a people-centred approach. We are pu putting individuals, people, um, in all their capacities, workers, bereaved, so forth and so on, at the heart of our inquiry. As Mr Gale said when he was uh, addressing you this morning, there were good cogent reasons uh, for trying to prioritise this evidence. Memories get stale is the obvious one. We uh, were anxious to hear individuals at the first opportunity. Um, that is why we put impact hearings first. If we delayed uh, impact hearings, uh, these people, these individuals, would not be heard until well into next year. We took, and I may say still take the view, that that is undesirable if we want to be person-focused and adopt a human rights approach. So that is another reason uh, why uh, we are proceeding in October. Um, you make the point absolutely correctly that politicians and others have already given evidence in the UK inquiry. Again, this comes back to the priorities or the focus that we have chosen to adopt in this inquiry. Um, we will hear from politicians during the implementation and decision-making hearings when these come later. But we thought that, frankly, it was more important to hear from the individuals as soon as possible rather than hearing from persons uh, who were taking decisions, important though that uh, obviously is. Um, let me see. Uh, what else did you raise? Disclosure. Yes. Um, I again acknowledge that there are times uh, when uh, disclosure should be made well in advance of any hearings. Um, you have been provided, you told me, with um, many thousands, I can't remember the exact figure, forgive me, but many thousands of documents, uh, uh, considerable periods of time, months in advance of hearings of the UK inquiry. Well, I've already said that the UK inquiry is being run in a different way from us um, and uh, was hearing evidence of those involved um, in decision making and implementation uh, at an earlier stage, at the beginning of their inquiry. Uh, and since those persons are those that would require documents or would be involved in relation of documents uh, that were produced, I can well see the need uh, for you having lots of notice of that. Uh, when we come to implementation hearings, I can assure you that we will give adequate time and you will get, I have no doubt, fairly voluminous volumes of productions, documents, uh, well <coughs> in advance. The hearings that we're going to have between now and Easter next year are of a different category. Uh, they are, obviously, primarily of individuals as witnesses, and therefore the documents which we will disclose to you will be 
in the majority witness statements <coughs> from those persons. It's Mr. Gale's ambition, which again he stated this morning, uh, and which I can assure you is being adhered to, uh, that he will try and give you a month's notice of those things. Uh, and in the exercise of our professional judgment, uh, for documents of the sort that we're going to use in the implementation hearings, uh, that is sufficient. Uh, you will get greater degree of notice when we come to implementation uh, at a later stage. Um, I think, um, is there anything I've forgotten? No, I think that is my answer to your questions. If there's anything I've missed, um, please feel free to <coughs> communicate with us and we will supplement anything I've said. Sorry, <coughs> the final question regarding the question of why clarification of the costs are being Yes. Um, yeah. Well, can I just, I didn't quite hear you. There was some coughing at the side. Clarification of the costs. So eight, million eight million pounds. pounds. Yeah, well, um, I think that's actually, again, relatively straightforward. Um, we have to set up a public inquiry. A public inquiry is of necessity uh, an expensive process. We had to engage staff. I may say uh, the staff continued to grow and to some extent continues to grow and we have to pay for staff. Um, we had to acquire premises, which I may say was a very time consuming and difficult job uh, and has not been without its difficulties. Um, we had to engage uh, academics to perform research who required to be paid. Um, we had to set up Let's Be Heard, which is a very wide ranging um, process uh, which continues to operate. It's been operating since the inception, well, it's been set up since the inception of the inquiry and is operating and will continue to operate for many months yet. Um, all those things cost a great deal of money. Um, and uh, that is why uh, we have expended to date something in the region of eight million pounds. I do not, I may say, consider the eight million pounds uh, to be uh, at all excessive, having regard to the scale of the organization and operation that we've set up. Yes, well, thank you, Mr. Anwar. Ms. Galbraith. Uh, Chair, thank you for the opportunity to ask questions on behalf of Care Home Relatives Scotland and PAMIS. Um, there are five key questions I, I would like to ask, which each relate to different issues. Uh, the Chair may prefer if I pause uh, after each question mm. to allow for answer on each specific point. The first question relates to the practical operation of restriction orders and anonymity. Um, it's considered this remains a little unclear, um, and on, in that respect, the inquiry is asked whether consideration could be given to providing a protocol or written policy regarding the practicalities. Uh, four particular issues arise uh, that I would like to highlight in that regard. The first is where uh, a person falls within the definition of those protected in terms of a restriction order. Will this prevent information that could lead to their identification being passed to other core participants as opposed to being disseminated to the wider public? Or would there have to be an application for anonymity? The second point is when can an individual apply for anonymity? Uh, thirdly, if an anonymity is refused, uh, can an individual withdraw their evidence? Mm. Uh, and lastly, if the inquiry consider a statement contains a criticism, will the identity of the critic be given to the organisation or individual being criticised? And will the critic be told about that and given the opportunity to withdraw that criticism? Right. Um, I think probably the answer is that um, we can provide you with some written protocol in relation to that. So far as the four specific subheads are concerned, 
I don't think um, I would be confident in answering the first question off the top of my head, and I think I'd prefer to have that answered in writing. Uh, I think I may apply that to the other three heads as well, although I'm prepared to answer those. Um, when can an application uh, apply for anonymity? I think any time is the answer to that, but we'll confirm that in writing. Um, can it be withdrawn? Yes, I think is the answer to that. Um, and uh, will, if there is a complaint, will the identity of the complainer uh, be revealed? I think the answer to that is probably no. But could you please t treat these as provisional answers and um, we will respond in writing. Thank you, Chair. Good, thank you. The, the second question is in relation to the timeline. Uh, the indication is that in October uh, there will firstly uh, be evidence from representatives of organisations mm. Can it be clarified whether this is only for care home or social care organisations, or is the term being used in a wider context such that it might cover um, those I represent? Right. I think I'll ask Mr Gale to answer that. <coughs> yes. Um, the position in relation to representative organisations is that it will be wider than simply care home. And I think I indicated there would be various charitable organisations that we are approaching. So I, w I won't give a particular example, but we have been in touch with numerous charitable organisations who advised groups with specific needs in the care sector and the health, um, health sector to give an indication of the sorts of impacts that they were experiencing or their members were experiencing, so it, it will be w it will be wider than care homes. So Thank you. Clear that, clarify that. Um, <clears throat> the third question is: What opportunities will there be uh, to use creative or multimedia means to hear evidence of those with profound uh, and multiple learning disability? Well, again, I think I can be quite straightforward. We will cater to the best of our abilities to. Um, enable persons in the categories you indicate uh, to give their evidence. We've given quite a lot of thought to that um, and um, I'm confident that we were able to satisfy the demand. Could I ask you and to any other co-participants to whom this affects to give us as much notice in advance uh, of witnesses in those categories uh, so that we can make sure uh, that we take the appropriate and adequate uh, means to facilitate the giving of their evidence. Thank you. The, the fourth question uh, relates uh, to what the, uh, was said earlier about the use of medical records. Uh, can it be clarified what approach will be taken to records from care homes or perhaps social work records, if, if the same, same would apply? Yeah. Um, I don't think we anticipate requiring to recover medical records uh, in relation to persons in care homes. But again, I'll ask Mr Gale to say a bit more about that. So far as social work records are concerned, um, I'm, again, I'm not sure if the requirement is going to arise on many occasions, but mm. let's see what Mr Gale mm. thinks. Where circumstances disclosed in a witness statement um, require us in our, in our view to obtain some more clarification about circumstances of a particular um, witness or, or, or about whom a witness is speaking, then we may wish to obtain um, more specific records. An obvious situation that we may be faced with is a date on which a particular resident contracted COVID, mm. and we may need to obtain records relating to that so that we can set in context what restrictions were being placed on the visiting of that relative. And so those are circumstances wh where we would consider doing it. Um, I must emphasize, however, that we are not and will not be in the business of obtaining widespread records in relation to individual care home uh, uh, residents. Those on, uh, beyond what is strictly necessary yeah. would, would be all that we would be requiring. 
and we would not be wanting, for example, to know why somebody was put into a care home three years ago. We would only want to know why or, or wh whether there was information relating to the care of that resident and the interaction <coughs> of the res residents' relatives with the care home at the material time of the pandemic. Thank you. I think I'd simply add to that, Mr. Galbraith, that Mr. Gill made clear when speaking earlier this morning that we are not concerned, obviously, within the terms of the remat of causation to any, of any person being in care home or hospital, and therefore our approach in the event that we require to recover records will be the most restrictive possible. Thank you. Uh, and the, the last point um, <clears throat> is, can it reassurance be given that the first tranche of evidence will not only consider the issue of deaths due to COVID in health and care settings, but will deal with wider issues of the impact of restrictions on individuals and their families, even where there was no death? And we'll also consider the impact on care home residents of all ages, not yeah. simply the, the elderly. Yeah, I think we're both absolutely clear the answer to that is in the affirmative. Thank you. No, thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you. <coughs> Very good. Um, well, I think um, that uh, answers the supplementary questions that have been proposed. So that formally brings an end to today's hearings. I, I would like to say, however, again, repeat my thanks for all, those, all of those that have attended today. Um, we appreciate particularly to the relatives uh, of victims uh, of this, that this has been a trying and stressful day. Um, and we're all the more appreciative for your appearance today. Thank you. And thank everyone else for their participation and help. Uh, and we look forward to this support going forward. Thank you all very much.